Uh, so I've, I've been following this stuff kind of just as a, a tech, you know, having an interest in tech and things like that for a long time. And uh, when the white paper came out, in what, uh, like late 2008 or whatever, I was like, wow, this is the, this is the delivery of the future that we have been reading about in science fiction novels, you know, going, going back for a long time, but certainly, you know, coming out of Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash and the Diamond Age and things like that. And I was like, wow, it is really coming. And it's going to be very libertarian as well, which was particularly exciting. Yeah. Um, but then I did this stupid thing where I was like, well, of course, I can't buy Bitcoin because I'm going to cover it. And that would be a conflict of interest. And I'd get too close to the story. So I did not buy Bitcoin, you know, when it first launched in 2009. So as a result of it, I am, I am simply watching my, uh, you know, my, uh, my philosophy of buying at the, at the top and then watching <laughs> it tip. You know, somehow it's not working so well. But overall, though, no, I, I mean, I've been interested in, you know, one of it, it's really in Reason's DNA. Um, the, anything that works to decentralize and disperse and kind of diffuse power throughout a system, I mean, that's, that is the operating system at work for, I think, for a libertarian, you know, that's, that's a libertarian understanding of the world. That's what classical liberalism was about, where, you know, where you allow people to live however they want for, you know, as much as possible, where they're not screwing over other people, you know, you create a kind of, um, uh, you know, framework, a lattice, almost, or like a coral reef, where everybody can do whatever they want without destroying the whole mm -hmm. system. And so, you know, crypto, and then later, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain, and then later crypto coins, as well as NFTs all build into that, I think. So it's extremely exciting. And, yeah, I don't think anybody really saw NFTs coming the way that they have emerged. And I think, you know, they, they still might be a fad on some level, but it is such a great instantiation of the premise of kind of crypto and of decentralizing things and of giving people the ability to express themselves and to, you know, ultimately create their own value um, in a market, you know, non-coercively. Um, so, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely excited by, um, you know, what's happened over the decade plus of, uh, of, of, of Bitcoin being around. Um, and I went to the blockchain or to the Bitcoin Miami conference uh, earlier in June. And what was amazing to me about that and was I was expecting that it was going to be kind of like old, you know, hard money conferences, like, you know, the, where people would go. And there's a lot of kind of scam work involved in talking about buying this gold coin versus that gold coin, or no, don't buy gold, buy silver, or buy this other precious metal, that type of thing. And, you know, Bitcoin Miami wasn't that at all. It was about, we are creating an alternative system that will supplement. Some people think it'll replace, but, you know, replace or supplement an existing system that constrains a lot of people and screws a lot of people over. And I was like, you know, I thought Bitcoin Miami was basically, it was like Woodstock for, for blockchain. It was Woodstock for crypto. Right, yeah. um, you know, it was the beginning of a cultural moment that, you know, has a politics to it, but ultimately is just about something like, you know, don't, don't bother, you know, trying to stop us. The question is like, will you, will you participate in this unfolding of a world that is much more leveled and much more interesting and much freer, you know, because of the technology and the ethos that fuels the technology. So it's very exciting. I mean, it's the most, you know, the past couple of years regarding kind of crypto, blockchain, Bitcoin more broadly, it's the most excited I've been since the early 90s when the web, you know, became the first kind of useful application, mega application of the internet. Right. So, yeah. Well, for me, I think I first saw Bitcoin as legitimate um, after it was actually after reading um, Atlas Shrugged. Oh boy! And yeah, You're because going there. well, I I love yeah, that yeah. book. I think I've read it like yep. three times already. Mm -hmm. And it you leave society behind. You separate from the system mm -hmm. that's crashing. Right. You still need to do commerce though. Yeah, I still need to pay you for doing something for me right. and vice versa. Well, I can't do it with gold like they did in the book. That's not right. Practical, right. Yeah. Right. And that was also a big, you know, a feature in uh, I'm old enough to remember the 70s when a lot of Christians like evangelical Christians were convinced, you know, that the rapture was coming and that, you know, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the money system is going to fail 
and you need to, you know, you need to have gold in order to survive because gold is always gold, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really impractical. Like nobody is going to be lugging around a backpack full of gold that you're using. Ship, shipping off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, because all you have to do is look down the street and you see people with backpacks and you know, okay, they're probably got gold in it. So I'm just right. going to steal it. I'm just going to steal their backpack. Yeah. 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 It is interesting. And the whole, you know, what, one of the things that I like about Bitcoin uh, more broadly is, and, and crypto is that you, you don't have to, like in Atlas Shrugged, you don't have to physically relocate to, re, to access a different world. This is what is great about this stuff. It's almost like a spirit world where if you know where to look, you can see it. And it, and it, you know, it resides it, you know, between you and me and it's on the streets and it's everywhere. And you can access that. And that is just, you know, that's wonderful because it allows us, again, I, I see all of this stuff coming out of like the internet more broadly defined as it's supplemental spaces. It's, it's not a replacement. We're, we're not going to the moon. We're going to go or to Mars. We're going to have, we're going to have bases there and we're going to go back and forth between the earth and, and Mars and the moon. And we're going to be going to Galt's Gulch, you know, but it's mostly a Galt's Gulch of the mind. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of great uh, because I, I like incremental change, in, incremental improvement, things like that. Yeah. Well, I also, yeah. if I may, I, as long as I'm blathering and please tell me to shut up if you want a more tightly no, no, focused answers or anything. But for me, the real, you know, both the demonstration project for Bitcoin in particular was Silk Road, you know, the, the website, yeah. the dark website that, Russ Ulbricht set up and, you know, in a, in a very libertarian and a kind of Randy and I wouldn't say a Randy way, but, you know, like this was going to be a place where you could do something peacefully that is heavily associated with crime and violence and, and things like that. And what was most interesting about that is that, you know, the whole Silk Road uh, kind of narrative or, or story showed us a couple of things. One, that it works and that you could bring together anonymous or pseudonymous buyers and they would actually transact goods and services. Um, the other was that it is not anonymous, you know, that this stuff is not anonymous, which is kind of good, you know, because yeah. I mean, you want privacy, but you don't want absolute anonymity all of the time or often. And, uh, and obviously that redounds negatively to the people who got caught running the site and things like that. But then the other thing, which is probably the most important, is that this stuff is kind of unstoppable because, you know, the feds came in and they shut down Silk Road pretty, you know, lickety split, toot sweet. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks, there were more sites up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are other exactly Silk Road, the yeah. same thing. And this remains, you know, the case with uh, obviously the government or the federal government now is, you know, going to within the next year, if not sooner, they're going to promulgate a bunch of regulations that will try to really kind of kneecap. And I, I think, you know, defenestrate or castrate the utopian surplus of, of blockchain technology and of crypto. And they'll, they'll do some of that, but they won't get it all. Mm -hmm. And it will remain whatever remains afterwards, whether people stay in the system or they flee it. Um, you know, we're going to be better off than we were 20 years ago when it comes to kind of money, currency, and store of value. How do you feel about the uh, broader DeFi space? Because I know, like for me, for everything that you just mentioned, I think, I don't think they'll be able to shut down Bitcoin ever. I do think right. they'll be able to go after some of these other cryptos, though, especially yeah, the ones that have a CEO. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, in this, we know, I mean, you know, we saw this PayPal when, you know, when PayPal was launched, it was very kind of utopian and it came with a manifesto about how this is, we're going to become a new payment system that is beyond the reach of central banks and armies and all of that. And, you know, that's just not true because it's like Visa and MasterCard at some point, these, you know, these repositories, they have to be physically located where people come up. Ultimately, they come up from underground or, you know, say they're in the spirit world, but they have to be made flesh when they're changing or converting from one, one currency to another and things like that. So there are choke points. Um, and, you know, there will be, you know, I mean, you know, and again, it's not like Ross Ulbricht was a, you know, a, a galaxy brain genius with any of this stuff, but like everybody who's going to, all the great cryptographers and whatnot, like there's going to be moments where governments or, you know, armed agents or criminals will be able to track them down and kind of shake them down. So, yeah. um, you know, we don't, we don't get all of that, but again, at the end of the day, I agree, they're not going to be able to shut down block, uh, Bitcoin. Um, and even if they are able to regulate it, 
you know what, it's going to be better than it was. Um, so it's like, you know, that's, that's good. And I think that's, you know, forward into the future is, is, you know, nothing is going to stop this. Yeah. For, well, from, from what I've learned over the years, I think if they ever do try to regulate Bitcoin in an effective way, it's mm -hmm. going to be the entry and exit points. So it'd be the exchanges right. of course. that they'll yep. regulate. And I mean, you know, New York City, where I'm calling, you know, where I'm talking to you from already has that in place in a lot of ways. And unfortunately, you know, this was a really uh, big problem for DeFi and for, you know, blockchain based, you know, crypto more generally, there was a moment where New York should be the world capital of this stuff. And the powers that be when this stuff started coming online decided to make kind of stupid onerous rules to govern exchanges and kind of what constituted things. So as a result, you know, people fled, uh, they went elsewhere in the same way that, you know, after we did, um, oh, God, what was the, um, the financial regulations that came out after the uh, tech bubble tech collapse, tech bubble. yeah, uh, you know, uh, but that, uh, you know, there, there were a bunch of accounting requirements put on publicly traded companies after the tech bubble, you know, in 2000, 2001, uh, Sarbanes Oxley was, uh, you know, that actually moved IPOs, then w went to London, you know, as a result of that. So that's the other thing, you know, it's a good question of like the gov governments can come up with effective regulations where I think most people are willing to say, you know, we live in a, in a network, you know, we're a system of systems and we're willing to pay a little bit of tribute, you know, to help keep the lights on or help people out who can't, who, who aren't cutting it themselves. Um, and if, you know, taxes and regulations are sensible and they're set at uniform, transparent and easily understood levels, you know, people pay them. But once mm -hmm. you start to try and extract, you know, steep, you know, kind of tribute out of people because you're angry with them or you don't like what they're doing, you know, they find a way to, you know, to route around the system. And certainly that is the, the case with anything technology, uh, technologically yeah. driven. Well, there's definitely an agorist sentiment in crypto, you know, yeah, like, sure. You know, I'm guilty of saying it, you know, taxation is theft. <laughs> yeah. I am on record as saying those are the three saddest words in the English language because I think <laughs> they hold back my my you know version of libertarianism, I think, as it's off putting. But I hear where you're coming from. But what is amazing, you know, is that America, you know, which has America among advanced economies in the OECD, we have the most progressive tax code. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, rich people pay a higher percentage of their incomes and they pay more of the total tax bill than any other OECD country. And we're pretty compliant, you know, and, and yeah. maybe that's because we're sheeple. Um, <laughs> I, I prefer to think that it's like, no, you know what? It's like, you know, we, we want to do what's right. We want to help people who need help and we want to fund. There are certain, you know, fewer than people think, but there are some public goods that are worth kind of funding collectively. Yeah. And if the government went into something like crypto, instead of saying, you guys are a threat to everything that we think we understand about how the world works and about centralized banks and about currency and about government power, you know, if they went into it saying like, you guys, you know, this is pretty great. And we want to, you know, we want to help you get on your way. And we're going to, you know, we're going to nick you a little bit to mm. come through this thing like people would be like who gives a shit yeah well I, yeah and you're you're right about the whole sheeple part because i mean as much as we complain about taxes nobody's protesting outside of the irs That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 and uh it to your point about new york though it really surprised me when wyoming and florida mm -hmm. came out as like crypto centers you know yeah. that, that really surprised me um not, well Florida, not so much because a lot of wealthy people live mm -hmm. in Florida, but yeah. Wyoming surprised me. How did you feel about that? Uh, you know, it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, Wyoming, uh, you know, which was one of the uh, one of the states that was up as a finalist for the Free State Project because mm -hmm. it fit their bill of having a small population and a kind of libertarian ethos. I think it was like, you know, Delaware, New Hampshire, Wyoming were among the three or three or four finalists. Um, and I, at, at the Bitcoin Miami conference, I interviewed Cynthia Lummis, who used to be the state treasurer of Wyoming, who was the congresswoman from Wyoming, their sole representative, and is now a senator. And she's created a crypto, you know, kind of coalition on, on Capitol Hill to kind of explain crypto and blockchain and Bitcoin to her kind of idiot colleagues in the House and the Senate. But she was like, you know, this fits so well with what kind of Wyoming is about. 
which mm -hmm. is about, you know, not, it's not about, you know, individualism in a bad sense. It's that, you know, you leave people and communities alone and they will figure out how to take care of themselves. And so they like the idea of privacy. You know, she was very upfront about saying that she thinks that, you know, what Bitcoin, one of its great values is that it's going to, it's, you know, it, it probably won't become the world's reserve currency, but it is, it will hold fiat currency, you know, uh, produced by the government, by the U.S. in check. And it, and it provides an alternative store of value. And then her other thing, which was great, and I think this is really important, is, you know, she also said that, like, the government doesn't have a presumptive right to know how much money you have or what you do with it. Right. Um, and Bitcoin enables that in a really stark way. Um, you know, one of the things is slightly off topic, but I've been, uh, we released a video a couple of weeks ago uh, that did spectacularly well on, uh, on Twitter, which is kind of where, you know, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community resides really in social media. Um, but about the fake attack saying that, you know, Bitcoin was going to use all the electricity on the planet yeah. and you know, blah, blah, blah. But the other, the other big argument that has stuck against Bitcoin is that, you know, the only reason to use it, the only case for it the only use case for it is, uh, you know, is criminal activity. It's like cash. Mm. Only criminals use cash. And Lummis was like, oh, you know, she didn't use these words, but she was like, fuck you. <laughs> like I, you know, you don't get to tell me where I spend my money or what I, you know, what money I spend. I mean, right. it's like, you know, if you, you know, if you think I'm a criminal, get a warrant, but otherwise let's just have, you know, a kind of get along society and, and Bitcoin, you know, this, this, this is another sign, by the way, that Bitcoin has made it that the, the, the attacks on it, the two primary attacks are that it's like cash and only criminals use cash and that it's going to use up all the electricity and all the energy in the world, which is flatly wrong. Mm. Um, these are the signs it is a real threat and that it's, its opponents are kind of desperate because they're making really bad arguments. Yeah, well, I've covered the energy concerns a few times and the more I do it, the worse they sound because, yeah. you know, Bitcoin uses the more electricity than New Zealand. Yeah. Well, New Zealand's it the size of Los more. Angeles. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's also like, you know what, I hate to say it to, you know, all the, the Kiwis at, down in New Zealand, but it's like Bitcoin produces more value than New Zealand. That was, you know, one of the things it's like Ar Argentina, like, you know, the question isn't uh, does, why does Bitcoin use more energy than Sweden? It's why doesn't Sweden produce as much value as Bitcoin? As Bitcoin and it's the right. third that's, that's largest the, currency. Yeah. It's got a trillion dollar market cap and, uh, you know, and it facilitates all sorts of stuff that um, is harder to do, you know, with without it. So more power yeah. to it. Well, I think at this point, anyone who's just throwing out these complaints just don't like it. It's not, right. you know, they don't really have a valid reason. It's just something they don't like. Yeah. And change, change is difficult. You know, there's no question. And, you know, especially at the governmental level, like, when you look at the, uh, you know, the House, uh, especially the U.S. Senate, but, you know, the, the government in general in America, the federal government has been getting older and older, um, you know, where they're looking like, you know, uh, like ancient seers from a, an old Star Trek episode or something. I mean, we have, <laughs> you know, we have, I mean, I think Joe Biden is older than Lenin's tomb at this point. And, you know, change, yeah, change, change is hard. And this is something that a lot of people have never really considered or understand or even want to understand, which is more power to Cynthia Lummis, who's a woman of a, of a certain age. And she is like down with, you know, this is really great stuff. This isn't, this isn't a threat. This is the future. Yeah. Well, the other thing I, I look at some of these people complaining and they just, at this point, it just sounds like Lud Luddites, you know, like yep. we hate mm -hmm. technology, all technology is bad, right. but then I have to point out you're saying this from an iPhone. So it's right. like, <laughs> like, absolutely. What, yeah. do, what do you, what's going on? And it here? doesn't mean, you know, because you benefit from uh, technology or from systems, it doesn't mean you shouldn't or can't critique them. I mean, that's, that's true. You know, that's how you yeah, make it all true. better. But yeah, I, I agree with that where yeah. people are comfortable with, you know, what they're comfortable with. And then they, you know, when they go to ban or demonize things they don't understand. That's a real problem, you know, which is also something that I see in the NFT space a lot where, you know, again, NFTs may be something of a fad or like artwork, you know, as you know, that is that is generating, you know, per unit sales of hundreds of dollars, if not thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. 
that may be a fad. I don't know, but um, but you know, it's fun and mm-hmm. it's you know, it's really interesting. And you know, when I go to even places like crypto.com, you know, in their exchange or certainly places like OpenSea, it's you know, it's really great. It's fun and interesting to see what people are doing. I went to a um a gallery in New York here on the Lower East Side last night that was uh, unveiling or debuting a series of crypto Rastas. So it's like kind of like oh, crypto yeah, yeah. punks, but it's like Rasta guys, right? And and women. And it's like, you know, it was remarkably uh, kind of creative and interesting. And this is also something that I think NFTs, you know, in in this in aesthetic sense. Um, lend themselves to are that that kind of long series of variations on a theme, you know, whether it's crypto punks or crypto Venetians or crypto Rastas. And that is also, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of interesting for the current moment, uh, because one of the things that is going on in the world and in America, although we tend to focus, uh, I'll get to this in a second, but one of the things that's been going on for the past 50 years, but and, and certainly over the past 20 or 30 years is that there's been this massive proliferation of identities and a person like of what what uh, people in literary and cultural studies would call subject positions. Like you're able to be more things simultaneously than you used to be. You know, in the, maybe in the you know the, in the fifties, you could be a jo- you know if you were a guy, you could be like a jock, a nerd, or a hood. Um, you know, now you can be you know you can be gay and muscular and hypermasculine and also be into you know, weird art or classical music or pop culture, all sorts of things. And there's variations for women and you you don't even have to be binary anymore. And so in a way, I think one of the things, one of the reasons why NFTs are interesting and are hot is as an art form, they are mirroring this, you know, incredible plenitude of possibilities that we are all inhabiting now. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of exciting. You know, that's why maybe the NFT is, kind of the the art form for the world we live in, where suddenly you don't have to be black or white, gay or straight, male or female, but you can be all you know, variations of all kinds of things, uh, yeah. which is exciting. And also puts, you know, this is another place where I think, you know, it puts kind of crypto and blockchain and tech at odds with a regressive element in society. I mean, I think um, I used to write a lot about this in the 90s about how everything was becoming more individualized and more personalized, partly because of the internet. It, it allows that, but it's also maybe we conjure that up because that's what we want. We don't want to be one of three large categories, one one drop in a large category. We want to be ourselves. So maybe we conjured the internet that creates this plenitude. But in any case, um, you know, right now when you look at a lot of political discourse, it's very much about defining blacks and whites, men and women, rich and poor. And we're, you know, instead of having like large categories that that are nuanced and complicated and sophisticated, that kind of map onto reality, we're trying to use, you know, kind of like 2D technology to map a 4D world, if that makes right. sense. Well, and, and I mean, it's human nature to want to categorize things, right? Right. right. And then we now we have ways to basically, well, that's what the whole metaverse thing is. You know, yep. you basically create the world you want. Right, right. My only thing about the metaverse is who's the people building it. Because yes, I agree. Snow Crash and Ready Player One tells me don't let Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> anywhere near it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what's good, though, about that, or, or not good about that, but, you know, what I think will allay or assuage your anxieties a little bit, and I share them, is that, you know, first off, we have a metaverse in a lot of ways, and it's, you know, Minecraft. Uh, you know, Minecraft already kind of exists as 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 a kind of uh, early iteration of it. And it's, you know, it's harder to control, you know, and, and if it's harder to control, that's where more people will end up because yeah. nobody wants to be stuck in Mark Zuckerberg's head. But the other thing to think about is, you know, that Facebook is escaping into the metaverse because Facebook is a walled garden here in, you know, kind of what counts as almost like meat space, even though it's online. And people don't want the walled garden. You know, people, uh, Facebook is dying. It's, you know, it's a lumbering beast, uh, you know, like AOL was before it. And before that, you know, the broadcast networks, it's just not delivering what people want. 
So they're trying to go into the metaverse because that's something new and different and possibly better. But if they, if they bring their own old mentality, which is that we're going to really kind of structure everything, we're going to limit your ability to respond in an individually expressive way, et cetera. We're going to be regulating everything and trying to keep you in our corner of the metaverse. People will be like, thanks, no thanks, I think. Yeah. Well, that's kind of my concern about the do space race because we have all these corporations trying to get to Mars. Yeah. And I'm like, well, whose law will they will we be under when we get there? Right. Because yeah, I'm not yeah. sure I want to be under Facebook's law. <laughs> right. <laughs> you or know? Tesla's mall, you know, law or something like that. Or yeah. Um, it's yeah. a real interesting question. And um, you know, again, I think this is where we can learn from human history. And uh, you know, there have been moments where, say, when European powers started to colonize the uh, the new world north and south america they did they did it poorly for the most part they did it with a lot of coercion and a lot of kind of monopoly power you know or, or you know one size fits all type of thing and um, we don't have to do that when we get to mars and we don't have to do that when we get to the metaverse you know we can we can put in build in different rules and what's what's important is that regardless you know all of these individual colonies will try to build their own little version of the world and say, this is the limit of the, the known metaverse. And you got to, you got to play along, but people will move very quickly outside of that and create their own colonies. And hopefully we'll, um, you know, well, it'll be, you know, it'll be a lot less violent, certainly, I think, phys you know, literally, but also figuratively, because we'll understand that, you know, the way things work now is through cooperation and, um, uh, and persuasion rather than force and coercion. My only real concern about the um, crypto's um, normalization that we've mm -hmm. been seeing, and I think that and because it's going to become a part of the metaverse, like right. you were just, just it, so, in some form, it's just the governments like um, China's working on one, Japan's mm -hmm. working on one, they're making their own. Yeah. And it's just, it, it grieves me to think that we gave them the idea to do this. And we thought it was bad when they could print regular money. Right. Now <laughs> they're going to be yeah, issuing yeah. stable it's coins. It's an interesting question, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I think about this a lot from, you know, in a United States context, because, you know, that's where I live. And we also, you know, in many ways are the worst um, you know, practitioner of just, you know, printing money because we want more stuff, you know, yeah. rather than actually thinking it through and paying, paying for it in a way that's going to hurt people your age a lot more than it's going to hurt people my age, because these bills are coming due. And I, you know, it's something like government spending, it's something like, you know, 40 or 50% of all government spending in the past two years has been borrowed. Um, and that's, you know, that's like World War II level kind of borrowing. And that, you can't sustain that, but we show no interest in actually paying for what we say we want as a society. Right. That's not going to end well. But as you know, one thing that is good, you know, there's a general rule called Gresham's law in economics that bad money, money that is, you know, comes from shady sources or governments or banks that aren't trustworthy, um, you know, it eventually gets driven out. It gets yeah. driven out because people value it less and less and people value good currency more. And that's one of the things, you know, this, and this is certainly true of uh, Bitcoin. I don't know that it, it does not necessarily extend to a lot of crypto, um, you know, where coins are kind of just made up willy nilly, but the whole value proposition of Bitcoin is that it is governed by laws, not men. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's code. Um, yeah, code it's law. algorithmic rules and it's predictable increase in supply. And there's going to be volatility, of course, in the price, especially, you know, as the system, you know, finally settles fully into place. But, you know, you'll see people using it more and more as the backing for whatever they're doing, because because it is not print, you know, it is not created by the Chinese government mm -hmm. and the U.S. government or the government of the Seychelles Islands or something mm -hmm. like that. So there's a corrective process you know, in a lot of this. And I think, you know, one thing that's good to think about is compared to 50 years ago, compared to 100 years ago or 1000 years ago, you know, most people don't know that much or care that much about money supply or, you know, uh, mm. banking and things like that. But more of us do and more of us know more about it and will act as a check, uh, hopefully on, you know, the worst extremes. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you about the uh, NFT that um, sure. Reason dropped. Mm -hmm. um, 
wh why? Okay, because of everything we talked about. So right. was the NFT one of the, because uh, you're going through the Webathon, the fundraiser, the right. annual. Rep yes. But did, who, whose mm -hmm. idea was it to uh, do an NFT? Well, and, and I'll point out that, you know, our NFT was auctioned uh, off at OpenSea by one of our trustees, a guy named Ted Barnett, who has a mm -hmm. long and uh, storied history in tech. Um, and, um, but the idea of doing an NFT came from our chief financial officer who was like, you know what, like these, these are getting currency and wouldn't it be kind of interesting to do that. And then, you know, in a discussion, uh, with him and, and the, the various people kind of that comprise the reason brain trust, um, we came up with this idea of representing, you know, the four people, uh, myself, Matt Welch, Catherine Mangu Ward, and Peter Suderman, who are on our weekly roundtable podcast that has a pretty big following. And it seemed like the beginning of, you know, kind of maybe, maybe we will do a series of kind of reason related NFTs, because we have a lot of different types of people on staff and kind of exploring what they do and whatnot. But it was kind of a way of signaling that we are we're interested in what comes next reason was established in 1968 um as a mimeographed you know like a xerox magazine a mimeographed in the xerox magazine before becoming um you know printed uh, properly uh, be, the typeset but we've always been interested in looking towards the future of what comes next because you know we want to deal with the problems of this world and we want to get policy right and we want to get attitudes right and think about how, you know what's the best way to deal with what we have right now but it's very libertarian and it's very interested in how do you create that next world or those next worlds that allow people to do something different more interesting more innovative where you're learning from the past and you're kind of you, you're uh, iterating you know you're running what john stuart mill would call like endless experiments and living and so like it seemed like a good time to do an nft and we thought it was something that our readers and our audience would enjoy and the response to it has been good. You know, we got, I think, like about a dozen offers um, on the NFT, yeah, which was up for about a week. Uh, and it ended up selling for about uh, three quarters of an ether. Uh, so it was like, you know, I think depending on the minute, you know, it, it's like around 3,200 bucks. Yeah. I think um, it was and that was kind 32 of 32 nice. last time I checked. Yeah. 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 I, and that was the, the final selling price was, you know, 70, uh, 0.75. Um, uh, and, um, so it seemed fun and it's, you know, the, we have always been interested in technology that liberates and most technology liberates technology that sticks around liberates, right. It, you know, we don't lock into the long-term for technology that makes us worse off. Um, we had been, um, you know, we were early to the web. We started our website in like 94 or 95 before a lot of magazines, particularly, you know, journals of opinion of culture and politics tend to be kind of backward looking and stodgy and slow moving to adopt new things. So we were on the web early in 2004. Uh, we published a, a run of the magazine, about 45,000 copies to subscribers uh, that went out with individual individualized covers. It had a picture of the subscriber's home address on or home oh, wow. taken from above with uh, we and on the front and back uh, covers and page, everything was personalized. Like we, we, we had a bunch of material and we were using it. It was a clumsy attempt. You know, it was kind of a day, date, mot, date, ugh, dot matrix printer level, you know, kind of look at what might, what might be coming in terms of individualized news feeds or individualized publications and whatnot. But, you know, it was kind of great. Um, and so, uh, you know, we were early to video online. We started doing this in 2007. Uh, Drew Carey, who's on our board of trustees, was interested in online video. And he's like, you know, like technology, the prices of cameras and of, of internet connections and of storage and of editing software, all of that is so cheap. Let's start making videos and, and you know, uploading them online as a supplement to our written work. And, you know, so we started doing that and the NFT fits perfectly into that. It's just, it's kind of a both, you know, a gesture and a movement. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like putting a bet on the future. I think. Well, I, I subscribe to the Reason YouTube channel too. <laughs> right, right. I appreciate that. Thank you very so, much. So, all right. So let me let me let you go because I, I know you're awfully busy over okay. there. Um, and I do have to say that you're literally the only reason why I watch Bill Maher. 
on a consistent oh, yeah. basis. Oh. <laughs> Anytime well, you're on. Matter is, you know, Matt Welch and Catherine Mangu Ward also are going on. You know, they go on it too. So watch it yeah. for them at the very least from reason. But well, no, I, I do, I do. But you're, I will you're... tell you though, you know, it's uh, I've been doing Mar now for like on and off for uh, I think it's like been about ten years. But yeah. he is he's one of the good guys in the current moment because a lot of comedians and a lot of people who considered themselves kind of liberals or progressives even because you know he likes bernie sanders he likes all of that kind of stuff he's one of the last guys from that camp that is really you know staying with free expression yeah um and pushing back on kind of um mob mentalities when it comes to trying to shut people down if they say something you don't like or if they think something you don't like so yeah. uh you know and this gives me some hope that you know i mean there's there's people on the far right who are unreachable and they're gonna you know go descend into whatever alt-right nonsense they want and there's people on the far left who are just you know woke and that's it you know they're done uh and and actually not even as much i mean some of it is woke and identity politics a lot of it is you know just economically they are so far left there's no bringing them back but there's this thick fat bunch you know in the middle that i think um you know is becoming you know more and more uh hip to the idea that you know what we've taken for granted a lot of really good values. Um, you know, things like, generally speaking, you know, freer markets, freer trade, more immigration, like openness in general, free speech, open expression. And we mm -hmm. got to start protecting it more because we, we got to start rehearsing the arguments and updating the arguments.